This Week in Agribusiness, serving America's most essential industry with agriculture broadcasters Orion Samuelson and Max Armstrong and featuring agriculture meteorologist Greg Solier. This Week in Agribusiness is brought to you by Case IH and your local Case IH dealer. Coming up on this weekend's broadcast, we have infrastructure on our minds. We're talking about that money coming from Washington, presumably your direction. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the broadcast here. Mr. Pearson and Armstrong together at the desk. Good to see you, sir. Good to see you, too, Max. And I tell you what, this infrastructure money and the funding has been a hot topic for the past year. And curious to see where it sits right now. Well, we know the condition of many of our roads and bridges. We know that we do need some upgrading. Let's talk with Mike Steenhook about that at the Soy Transportation Coalition. We uh, heard with much fanfare the other day, the bridge money is coming. What's your take on that? Uh, is, is it just for major structures out there or will some of it trickle down to counties and townships, Mike? One of the things that we were appreciative of within the, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act was that it, it did specify that the money should not just go exclusively to address the needs of urban America. It also needed to flow to the needs of rural America. And that was something that we were, were very insistent upon that we can't just ignore one or the other. We really need to attend to the needs of both. So we're, we're very appreciative of the fact that rural was actually specified and we are talking about some of the infrastructure needs confronting rural America and, and you don't get a better example of that than rural roads and bridges. So seeing that announcement the other day and this process starting to get implemented, it's gonna be a lengthy process, um, but we're happy to see it at least get at least get started. I don't mean to indicate that uh, big city bridges don't matter. And, and, and lest we forget that uh, I-40 bridge at Memphis, when that thing went out uh, several months ago, that certainly had an impact on Medigan agriculture in that region, didn't it? It, it had certainly had an impact on vehicular traffic because that bridge was closed for a pretty extended period of time, but it also had impact on maritime traffic because you know barges use the Mississippi River and just during the three days that the Mississippi River was closed at that juncture due to the I-40 bridge uh, closure um, over a thousand barges had accumulated mm -hmm. in a queue and and so it just shows how significant of a artery the inland waterway is for commerce including agriculture and so it's really critical to make sure that we've got these, not only the, the urban bridges, you know, like the Interstate 40 uh, that goes from Memphis to Arkansas, but also these rural bridges that are, that really serve as the initial link in the supply chain for farmers. And, and quite frankly, if you don't have an effective and well-maintained inventory of rural roads and bridges, it doesn't matter the quality of our freight railroads, our ports, our inland waterways, because the, 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 the delivery will never occur. So you really have to make sure that that infrastructure that is most relatable to farmers is well functioning as well. Mike, you mentioned these big piles of money are being distributed to the states. Do we know the mechanics of how that money gets from the feds down to the county level? Will they be bidding for different projects or is each state going to be different? Yeah, some of it is gonna be through an existing formula. So the, the State Departments of Transportation are going to be the main implementers of this piece of legislation. The funding will flow from the federal government in many cases to the states. And, and so these states will have a, a, a formula that, that's similar from one state to the next. It's not identical, but similar uh, regarding how once they receive funding for, from the federal government, to what extent does it go to these particular projects in these particular areas of the state? So a lot of that money will be will be will be funded and dis dispersed via that existing formula. But this is a discussion that state departments of transportation are having with the U.S. Department of Transportation to make sure that their their system is compatible with the the dictates of that law. Um, there's also going to be some a number of new grant programs that. Will, will require a county, a municipality to actually submit grant applications, maybe collectively in partnership with one another. So there's gonna be some new grant programs as well. But again, most of that, this is gonna be dispersed through 
uh, existing formula. So w what's currently happening right now is state departments of transportation are having visits with counties, municipalities, other stakeholder groups to really making sure what the priorities are uh, and, and how this money is actually going to be allocated, uh, you know, probably starting later this year. Mike, in the minute remaining here, for someone watching us who maybe isn't familiar with what's going on, if a farmer can't haul across a bridge in his or her community, it's not just an inconvenience, it's an economical setback too, isn't it? Certainly, you know, when you're when you're just driving from work from the from home to the office and you have a de you have to incur a detour due to a bridge being closed. Well, that's an inconvenience. But when you're a farmer transporting thousands of bushels of product from your farm to the delivery location, that detour that you will have to incur due to that closed bridge, it'll have to be repeated over and over again. So you're having repetition of that detour. And also when you're transporting a semi full of soybeans or grain, that's going to be more costly as well. So this is an inserted cost into our food delivery system simply because of the fact that our transportation system isn't operating as it should. I think when we've seen those lists of uh, structurally deficient bridges, it, it has really gotten our attention how many are out there, and we'll uh, hope for improvement on many of those. I'm sure the money won't get to all of them, but you folks will be watching that. We'll be checking in with you from time to time, too, Mike. Thank you for your time. Thank you for having me. Mike Steenhook with the Soy Transportation Coalition. This portion of This Week in Agribusiness is brought to you by Agrigold, your seed ally in the field, with unparalleled options that perform on your farm. Learn more at agrigold.com. Had the chance to catch up with Tommy Grizzafi. Wanted to pick his brain about the markets. Tommy, looking at corn, $6 is in the money. Where do we go from here? Well, we have a lot of things going on politically. We're uh I don't know if Putin's going to call you or me personally and tell me before he invades. I wish I knew that. But crude oil's absolutely on fire this week. And every time I thought corn could sell off, I look up and crude's up $1.50, $1.50. Just filled up on the way here, as you know, three fifty, And that'll be probably three seventy-five here in the next few weeks. So energies, BTUs have a bid all across the world. Europe's in a little bit of trouble. It's cold. It's winter. And as you know, Russia controls an incredible amount of energy. How's that tie into corn if they were to invade into Ukraine? Uh, wheat put two back-to-back -back monster days. We'll see how we finish for the week. Interesting. And on the corn side, do you see more strength coming with the bid under the energies? <laughs> well, you're making me laugh because today was so busy and I thought I'd be here earlier. And it's wonderful it's busy. Sometimes we get nervous we're going to be busy because these USDA reports, and here it is, it's just happening. Like, we were busy because we were open. Clients call in, they're like, why are we so busy? I'm like, because we're open. <laughs> and, and this is really interesting. So... Can it keep going? Yeah, it, it, it really can. Uh, I looked at a bunch of options today that were out of the money and they're very expensive. To buy upside is expensive, which means someone thinks we can go there, Mike. Interesting. Tommy, on the soybean side, we're starting to see some export demand come back after a couple weeks of bad export sales. What does that tell you about the global demand for soybeans? Typically China, if they think there's a problem in South America or the world, it's just not China who buys from us, but they, they tend to hedge their bet and they'll start buying from us. Now, South American harvest has started and it should go well, but yet they're still coming into us, which makes me think they're hedging their bet as weather in Argentina and Brazil. You know, part of it's raining, part of it's not. If you look at the, the, the Twitter world, there's arguing it's okay. No, it's a disaster. Time will tell, but the demand is there and that's wonderful. Given the uncertainty down in South America, both Brazil and Argentina, how are you handling growers making some marketing decisions on their old crop beans right now, not knowing what could come out of South America? There's not a lot of old crop beans left, or if they're left, the American farmer is strong handed. They have the cash. If they have them in their bin, there's a reason, and they will probably hold those t till May, June, or July. They may sell them at a much lower price, but if we go up again, they're going to say, I knew it, and that's why I have these, and I sold them dollars higher than where everyone sold them at harvest. So for folks who want upside, they're still buying calls, call spreads. Some people are long futures, a little risky when you have a 14 in front of you. Of course, as you know, futures and options always have risk, and uh, it's a dynamic market, my friend. It certainly is. On the new crop bean side, Tommy, given the rally we've had, is it time to start pulling the trigger on new crop bean sales? It is, and not only have I helped people sell uh, new crop, but we're doing November 23 also, and that's very interesting to go that far out and say, hey, maybe all these supply chain issues work themselves out, and we trade lower prices in years to come. Interesting. What price are you looking at as a good price to make some sales in 23? We started at 12.75, and we have offers up at 13, and 
We'll see if they hit. Man, how much of your current old or new crop have you uh, marketed already? Uh, it, it's pretty light. You know, guys don't, especially North Dakota farmers, they don't like to get real out front in their skis, especially coming off a drought year. In Iowa, Iowa farmer, that would be a different story, and we have them pretty aggressively forward sold, about 30%, and then the rest we're going to throw out put on. Of course, they don't have crop insurance yet for the next 30, 40 days. That's true. A lot of things to keep an eye on. The markets will continue to move, folks, and we're going to be talking about those markets here on This Week in Agribusiness when we return more from Tommy Grizzafi. This portion of This Week in Agribusiness is brought to you by AgriGold, your seed ally in the field, with unparalleled options that perform on your farm. Learn more at agrigold.com. And we're talking markets today with Tommy Grizzafi of Advanced Trading. Tommy, we briefly touched on corn. I want to get your thoughts on that in a little more detail. With regard to sales, new crop corn sales, is it time? We, we've been selling. Again, we don't have crop insurance yet. So if they're afraid to sell, we'll protect. Clients in North Dakota are still afraid to do anything after last year's drought. Canada is importing corn from anywhere they can get it. Now, there's some problems up there. So depending on where your clients are, would be a different motivation. This week we're in Iowa, it'll be a different speech this week. I could tell the Iowa farmer, give 40, 50% sold, lean on your APH, you know, you have crop insurance, but they're used to producing big bushels here and there's no reason they wouldn't again this year. That's, history, as you know, growing up here, that's, right. that's what we do. And what we do in a large part with that corn is convert it into ethanol. Tommy, you mentioned energies are hot. Do you see ethanol being strong all year? It's, uh, it, it, it doesn't, I sold a couple crude oil futures this week and I lost money on them. You'd think I'd learned my lesson. Energies are absolutely on fire. BTUs are bid across the world. Natural gas, crude oil, mm -hmm. uh, they're pumping. <laughs> I just got done, as I walked in here, I was listening to President Biden speak about energies. He addressed that there's inflation. He addressed a lot of things here. Hour and 29 minute speech and he went over all the challenges that the American public and energies are definitely in high price is one of them. So the fact they're talking about it openly, it's not a secret. Inflation's here to stay. Food, food and energies are a big part of that. Tommy, speaking of here to stay, or at least prices catching a bid, you mentioned the wheat market. That thing had been suffering for a couple weeks. Seems like it turned around this week. Is this all on the back of the Ukraine-Russia tensions? I, I would think so. We found out in that crop report there's a little bit more planted acres of uh, wheat, that Kansas City wheat. Obviously, we don't know what we're going to plant up there, up north. Again, that pull into Canada. You, you wouldn't believe it until you see it. What you're going to see when you talk about the Canadian-American relationship is that the truckers can't go back and forth, the vaccinated, not vaccinated. It's If there's going to be food running out of shelves, it's not going to be in America. It's going to be in Canada. And so that makes people store up on stuff, pasta and everything else. There's supply chain issues. We know there's wheat in other parts of the world, but we're actually supplies are low. Money's looking for a home and wheat's a, a commodity that moves. It does. Tommy, you mentioned the, the Canadian vaccine requirement on truckers crossing the border. Do you, is that going to have any major impacts on the cash grain business in this country? Does enough change hands across the border for it to impact ag in a big way? Absolutely, especially with the drought that they had last year, Mike, they, the Canadian growing area is about three times bigger than the state of North Dakota. So what's happening is an incredible amount of grain gets trucked within 25, 50 miles from our border to theirs. If we can't get the truck drivers to do it because of legal reasons versus their rules versus ours, we're gonna get the trains involved. And you could see that freight of uh, just absolutely explode. That's the sign right there. Watch that freight up in the PNW and up into Canada. That makes sense. Tommy, you touched on the, the differences between the U.S. and Canada. The dollar value is a big one of those. Where do you see the dollar going in 2022? It's, uh, we're, we're still the best home in the, in the worst neighborhood, and there's no other way to say it. The American dollar is, uh, it gives people comfort. We had a stock market pull back this week. Nasdaq's almost down 10% on the year. It, it doesn't tend to stay down there long, but yet, that's where we are, and the dollar is not, of all the things I look at, I don't look at the dollar like I used to. We saw a big bid in gold and silver this week. We'll see if that could follow through, too. Interesting, and do you, do you see a strong bid following the dollar higher on gold and silver? No, it just, the gold and silver just went, and one thing that's caught my eye is Bitcoin oh. is not moving this year. Money's looking for a home, and it's not going there. Well, thank you, Tommy Grizzafi. That's Tommy Grizzafi from Advanced Trading. Lots of things happening in these markets. We appreciate your insight. Chad Colby's look at agriculture technology comes your way next, brought to you by the IBM Watson Decision Platform.
combining AI with Internet of Things data to help agribusiness increase yields, improve quality, and drive sustainability. Well, it's January, so all that new 2022 technology is being unveiled. Chad Colby has a story about some of the new technology options coming from Apple. He shares that with us right now. If you recall last year, I upgraded computers to that new 13-inch MacBook with the M1 processor from Apple. Now, recently, Apple has expanded that line. And now in their flagship models, they have it in a 14 and a 16 inch with the M1 processor. Now there's a lot of enhancements to this new machine. It's got faster RAM, it's got a new keyboard, it's got a new screen, so on and so on. But that's not why I'm putting it on the tech segment this week. I'm adding it because this thing is an absolute game changer in terms of high-end computer power. If you go to Apple's website, you'll see they still offer all three models, the 13 and the new 14 and 16 inch sizes. I opted for the 16 inch when it was time for me. I also upgraded to 64 gig of RAM, which is the most I've ever had, and a two terabyte hard drive. I also want you to pay close attention to that lower left hand corner. If you configure your new machine, you'll see an ETA and right now it's mid to late March. Once I got my new computer, I already knew this thing was going to be a monster of performance because if you look online anywhere, you can see the comparisons. And there's really nothing that compares to the kind of raw horsepower in a laptop that this new machine has. As far as setting it up goes, this is really slick. Just like an iPhone, you set your old computer next to it and it automatically transfers everything over. Photos, passwords, email accounts, everything. It's super slick. I don't recommend this computer unless you have high-end needs. Maybe you're using AutoCAD or in my case, you do a lot of video editing. You can see right here in this screen recording, this is in real time. This thing does not miss a beat editing in 4K. If it's your time for a new computer, now is a great time. For This Week in Agribusiness, I'm Chad Colby. Thank you, Chad. I tell you, that man sure does love his Apple technology. Folks, stick around. Later on in the program, we'll talk to Adrian DeSutter about mental health on the farm. Thanks for joining us here on This Week in Agribusiness. Max, you know, this time of year, when we get into the doldrums between harvest and planting, obviously farm meetings kick up. And one of the topics I've heard more about in recent years has been farm mental health. I'm sure that accelerated with COVID and the challenges the ag sector saw over the past couple of years. But I understand you were recently having a conversation about it down at the American Farm Bureau. Yeah, you meeting. know, it's no longer behind the curtain, Mike, I guess you would say. Uh, many people are bringing this out into the open, especially in the Farm Bureau organization. The past couple of annual meetings of the American Farm Bureau Federation, they have devoted portions of the program to the discussion of mental wellness among our farmers and ranchers. I talked with Ty Higgins about that. Ty is with the Ohio Farm Bureau Federation. He's been helping lead the discussion in that state Farm Bureau. I said, is the situation getting worse out there? Well, I think the stress level is higher for sure. When you look at what we've seen in agriculture even since 2012, uh, add to that a global pandemic. In, in Ohio, we had trouble planting in 2019. A million and a half acres, a million and a half million acres of soybeans and corn weren't planted. And so farm stress is, I would say it's as relevant now as it maybe was back in the 80s during the farm crisis. So it, it's a tough conversation to have. But what we did here at AFBF was we got four state farm bureaus together. We talked about what we were doing. Uh, in Ohio, we were doing a lot uh, on the training front and, and being able to be able to see what farmers are going through and maybe some telltale signs about maybe if they need some help. Uh, Colorado is doing some great things on, on the front of uh, resources for farmers. And uh, Minnesota has a helpline, as does South Carolina. So really just a chance to share what other farm bureaus are doing and, and give other state farm bureaus across the country some resources they might need if they want to start up their mental health uh, resource uh, page as well. So what if you see something that isn't quite right? What if you sense that uh, maybe that fellow, that woman down the road, they're struggling a little bit. There's uh, something going on there. I asked Ty if he has any advice for a neighbor who wants to reach out to that farmer to help him or her. I just know that those conversations aren't comfortable. And 
nobody really wants to talk about it. But in order to get the conversation started, we have to break through that stigma of mental health in agriculture. We have to understand that farmers may feel like they're alone. They're in the cab by themselves and they only have themselves to blame or disappoint if something goes wrong. But there are thousands of farmers out there that just aren't having the best of times right now. We have to realize that and let farmers know that they're not alone and that there are resources out there to help them through what they're going through, whether it be on the farm, their personal life, what have you. We have seen farm crises before, certainly in the United States ag community, often paralleling challenges in the ag economy, though not always. Ty Higgins shared with me that the data on what's going on now is not very pretty, actually. Well, you look at the rate of suicide in agriculture, it's up by 40% over the last 20 years. That's astounding. Uh, people need to realize, though, people ask me all the time, I, th I thought farmers were tough, I thought they were gritty. Yeah, farmers are tough and they're gritty, but just because their hands are calloused doesn't mean that their heads and their hearts are as well. They're human beings. Uh, they're going through a lot of the things that we go through in society on top of the farm stress that they have. And so it's a difficult time in agriculture right now, for sure. Sometimes you'll think that there's nothing else that you can do. There's so much coming at you from different directions. Ty Higgins reminds farmers and ranchers that it isn't all just about the farm. Yeah, there's a lot of pride in agriculture, and, and rightly so, and it's a persona that uh, America has given to agriculture to be tough and gritty, but it's not one that we have to accept all the time. We have to realize that we're more important than our farm as farmers. Uh, we are moms and dads and grandmas and grandpas and brothers and, and sons and daughters. We're so much more than what we do on the farm, and we're so much more important to the family that we, we try to support by doing what we do on the farm. But who we are as a person goes so much deeper than, than what we do uh, in that combine or in that tractor cab. Ty, is there any age range that is more susceptible in the farming community than, than other age categories? We've seen this issue throughout the age categories, anywhere from the early 30s into the 70s. But I'll tell you where the real opportunity is to, to get these resources out there and really spread the message is with our young farmers. Our young farmer and rancher communities, our Collegiate Farm Bureau, they had these types of resources through their high school and college careers. Uh, they're familiar with farm stress and, and mental health and the resources available. When they go home for winter break or for summer break, they might be able to share those messages a little bit easier with mom and dad and grandma and grandpa if they see those signs of farm stress and mental health and really move the needle for us, and I think that's a real opportunity for agriculture. Ty Higgins urges farmers and ranchers to be alert, to be watching that neighbor down the road, to see if there's something else going on that maybe isn't usually happening there. Yeah, I, I had some a conversation earlier today with somebody that says, farmers just won't reach out. I don't want to put all the pressure on the farmer struggling to reach out. It's up to us as neighbors and as friends down the road that if we see something, if the farm's getting unkempt or they're leaving uh, just some machinery out that, that needs to be put in the barn or just something's not right, it's up to us to point out to them that I see something here that just is a little off kilter and I think I can help you find some resources to, to get you back where you need to be mentally and physically. Ty says it's just important to be aware, to ask that question of a neighbor or a family member, are you doing okay? Do you need some help? Can we do something to, uh, to be helpful to you here? You know, the worst thing is after the fact, after something happens, that second guessing and, and you're around and, and you say, what could I have done? Could I have done something? Could I have made a difference? And I think that should be a lesson to all of us to intervene if we think there's a possibility. Uh, many of us, I think, have hesitated in the past. Mm -hmm. We don't want to jump in. We don't want to be a problem, but uh, it's far, far better for us to to have some intervention there. For it sure. is. Be proactive. I'm glad to see the agriculture industry bringing this yeah. more to the forefront. We'll talk more about it here in weeks ahead on This Week in Agribusiness. Just ahead, stay with us here. We'll be right back after this break. This Week in Agribusiness, serving America's most essential industry, is brought to you by Case IH. Welcome back to This Week in Agribusiness. Thanks for joining us. Max, this time of year, the days get a little shorter, the nights get a little longer, and it's cold, and it gets people thinking about their mental health, and maybe it uh, gets a little stressful. Oh, I know I do, and it's tax season coming yes. up. You know, that, that brings me down as well. But the last time we talked with Adrian DeSutter, it was in the spring, those days in May when farmers were able to get out and do some work. It's a little different scenario now. Adrian, welcome to the broadcast this weekend. I want to get a little guidance from you on how maybe we can approach this tougher time of the year. And for many farmers or ranchers uh, with the solitary existence, it can be a little bit difficult 
during the winter time. Absolutely, and thanks again for having me, Max. It's always good to have these conversations. Um, yeah, you know, we've heard of the winter blues, and really anyone can get in a funk in the winter because, like you're saying, the weather's cold. You can't get out and do some of the exercising and things that maybe you're used to. I'm not used to that because I don't do the outdoor exercising, <laughs> so that doesn't that doesn't affect me. But, but you know, we're restricted. We're a little bit isolated, and as we've seen in the last couple of years, isolation can really take its toll on us. Um, there's a couple of things that we need to keep in mind, though. When we are in our off seasons um, farming, you know, we don't let our equipment in our fields just sit. We make sure that we take care of them. We we take a look at what needs to be done. Maybe it's now, maybe it's later, um, but we make sure that before we have to get them in full swing again, we take a look at, at what repairs need to be done, what type of tiling needs to be done, and so it's really important for us to do the same thing with ourselves. Experts will tell you you need to eat, you need to move, you need to exercise, you need to get your rest. Those are all great tips, but of course, everyone's a little bit different. So making sure that we're doing that maintenance and taking a look at ourselves um, to manage our own stress in the way that we need to uniquely is really important. The meeting season is underway and many of our friends will be there in hallway conversations or in a lounge somewhere visiting. They're not just sitting in a classroom atmosphere. Is that helpful too to, to meet with friends, a young farmer meeting with another young farmer? Absolutely. You know, it's interesting because when the pandemic first started, a lot of farm friends were saying, well, this is kind of what we're used to. We don't, we're kind of isolated anyway. We don't do a lot anyway outside of the farm and outside of the rural areas. But then those meetings shut down for longer periods of time. And I remember my husband saying, you know, for me, going to a corn growers meeting every every month is kind of my therapy. It's kind of my way to vent with people that are like minded. Um, so this conference season, this meeting season in the winter is definitely a helpful tool. Um, if you know, even if even if being social isn't your thing, just being able to get out and hear that other people are sharing some of the same either struggles or um, just same experience as you can can be a healing experience. It certainly can. And Adrian, when we're talking about isolation, getting out and doing things, engaging with others is certainly good, but also so is helping others and lending a hand. Do you have any thoughts on on farmers getting together with one another during this uh, winter season? Oh, absolutely. And that's a wonderful thing to bring up because there is something healing. Again, studies will tell us that doing things for other people um, lifts our spirits essentially um, and, and it, it increases the chemicals that work in our body that that, ha that are those happy chemicals um, so yeah anything you can do whether it's in you know your churches or your local communities food banks um, anything that you can do with your farmer organizations um, to, to help your communities and help each other out is definitely a good thing and of course we know that, that keeping an eye on each other as farmers is so important um, especially during these times where we aren't necessarily out and about with each other just keeping just being vigilant for things that might seem off um, things that might you know maybe someone doesn't seem like themselves making sure that we're keeping an eye on each other and taking that step to ask hey how's it going you seem a little off today um, you know really can show people that 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 they're being cared for Adrian, you lift our spirits when you join us here. We appreciate that. We'll count on you to do that another day. Thank you. Thanks so much, Max. Adrian DeSutter on the farm in central Illinois. Greg Solier now brings us his farm weather forecast for the week ahead. Presented by Pivot Bio Proven 40. Predictable, productive, weatherproof. Turn to a better nitrogen. Turn to Pivot Bio Proven 40. Learn more at pivotbio.com. Well, if you were to plot it on the graph, it would look like this in many instances, uh, the way the weather has been turning out in several of our communities. Let's talk with Greg Solier right now to see how this week ahead will be. And in some areas of the U.S., more snow than you would typically see in, you know, the Midwest, for example. But we have had some improvement to the drought, probably too much of a good thing, judging stream and river issues primarily over the western end of Washington State and Oregon. Eastward, the drought continues on. And yeah, 
Yeah, it's uh, kind of quieted down moisture wise. Uh, La Nina typically gets these uh, weather systems are cranking and going, but note the upper level winds are in in a ridge position, so there's still a couple of shots of cold air, but moderating into the high plains areas. Nice to see some snow on the ground the farther east across the Dakotas you go. Seasonal weather pattern across the interior west, maybe a stray shower coastal sections of Washington state with a weather system offshore, and it largely stays there. Upper level winds are buckling here. They're down sloped across the northern and central parts of the Rockies, so there's a warm up in temperatures, erosion of snow cover. It's been back and forth, and the ups and downs of temperatures well max have been playing out across the Dakotas, but overall, over the northwestern part of the country, pretty quiet weather picture here over the second half of the month of January. Uh, we do foresee maybe some semblance of a Santa Ana condition, offshore winds into uh, California, so a uh, warm up, but note the lack of moisture there as well the past four or five uh, weeks. Uh, if you were to take the precipitation year up to about April 1, we're only running 50 to 60 percent of normal. If you were to cut it off right now, about 100 percent of normal. But again, La Nina years are not conducive to getting organized moisture on a regular basis across the drought areas of the West, including California. Little weak system down across West Texas cotton of no concern. Seasonal uh, high pressure and temperatures across the central and south end of the winter wheat belt. Yes, the dryness and the drought is expanding again. Warmth in the desert southwest. Pretty quiet weather picture. Maybe a little rain and drizzle. Napa on northward later on into the week. As a much younger man, I remember in the wintertime we would get into a cold stretch and we'd stay there. It seemed like for weeks we don't see that much anymore. No, we don't. Although the cold has been dominant, but uh, so far the winter season, primarily northern areas of the plains, Great Lakes region. Amazing how these cold highs like to migrate where the snow cover is, and that's where it's played out of late. Of course, we've had a lot of snow south of the Ohio, and there's another wedge of cold air, another clipper system to dust the ground over over parts of the Midwest. Yeah, amazing parts of the central Corn Belt, Illinois, Indiana, and western Ohio, five to 12 inches shy of normal. That's on the snow, a snow drought, if you will, but soil moisture is in good shape. Uh, in any event, another little clipper system and a warm front on the move. The western complex moderates nicely with uh, wind and a better feel. Watch the footing over eastern sections, uh, seasonal temperatures, and another dusting of snow for the Great Lakes region. Central and southern parts of the Plain States. Again, this weak weather system coming across the Rio Grande. It'll drop into South Texas here. Otherwise, uh, yeah, it's been interesting with cold and snow and ice, but it is a quieter weather picture for the Delta and points out to the east with a moderating trend in temperatures over the plains. Again, Gulf Coast areas, maybe a couple of showers back into the south part of Texas, the end portion of the week. How do you see the eastern part of the country now in the week ahead? Again, the cold air has been uh, into play and the snow cover as well. And of course, that has improved the drought condition despite the wind and the couple of feet of snow last week. Downslope uh, conditions, I should say, downwind of the Great Lakes region. The lake effect snow belt continues on uh, and a couple of clipper systems to move on through in this very cold air mass. This is where it lines up this week across the upper Midwest, Great Lakes region, the northeast of New England, and moderate temperatures, a warm up, if you will, back west of the Missouri River, otherwise seasonal cold across the eastern Corn Belt. And still a few sprinkles of rain and flakes of snow, and the moisture has been a benefit despite the snowfall in those drought areas of the Mid-Atlantic region down across the Gulf Coast areas, including Florida. Yeah, last week's severe weather, this front uh, along it, a couple of disturbances and more shower and thunderstorm activity back into play, and a freeze, too, for the Carolinas late in the week. Greg Sodier is back with his extended farm weather forecast for the country, presented by Pivot Bio Proven 40. Predictable, productive, weatherproof. Turn to a better nitrogen. Turn to Pivot Bio Proven 40. Learn more at pivotbio.com. Cold and snow have been far reaching in recent days. We'll see if that's the case of the week ahead. Greg, the Pace family farm near Raleigh, North Carolina, they posted a video the other day. They had some freeze damage on their strawberries, I noticed there, not far from Clayton, North Carolina. Ah, sounds familiar. And yeah, there's more cold in the forecast for the coming week, but note the absence of any uh, organized moisture. You usually get that old one, two punch. First, it's the snow and ice, and then the cold wave weather this week, uh, lacking on any major storm development. We've had more of those over the southern parts of the country than we have over parts of the Midwest. In any event, you want to melt down some of the precip, the snowfall here, quarter to half inch. And this is primarily lined up downwind of the Great Lakes region, maybe half to one inch down through Florida. Yeah, rough weather last week, uh, far quieter weather picture, kind of cool as well. Gulf Coast area back into areas of South Texas, little to none across much of the dry and drought ridden areas of the plains. And that's worsening and will continue to worsen, mind you. Pacific Northwest late in the week, maybe a quarter to half inch 
nothing for the valleys, the mountain areas of California. With that lack of the snow cover in the plains, we need to keep an eye then on, well, the temperature and uh, how warm it could be, how cold it could be there. Yeah, I tell you, the, the warmth is great from an outdoor work and livestock standpoint. Not great, of course, with dryness and drought, and that just uh, increases evaporation. And these warm-ups have been accompanied by wind. Well, uh, kind of a more sedate uh, temperature pattern as in it ought to be back to normal and a little bit below average here. No real harsh weather. That is over the heavier snow packed build, building areas of the Great Lakes region, the St. Lawrence River Valley and the cold air. Probably still some frost and freeze potential all the way down into the Florida Panhandle. Some warmth across the Rio Grande, Central and Southern Valleys of uh, California and an absence of any major winter storms. Just these little trowels, disturbances, clippers adding to the snow pack across the Canadian Prairie, Upper Great Lakes, the Northeast of New England. Normal snowfall for the Great Lakes and still uh, limited precip across much of the Corn Belt, Central and Southern Plains and still back into the central and southern valleys of California. This is more typical of La Nina. Visiting with Orion the other day, it reminded me his expression has often been, we kill that winter wheat crop about nine times every winter with concern about uh, winter damage, freeze damage, winter kill. Yep. And then we usually wind up with a fairly good crop after all. But we do worry about that. And we certainly do. And of course, over the past week, we've had readings into the single digits uh, all the way, even sub-zero cold with patchy snow cover at best in uh, parts of Kansas. But as we get into the uh, first uh, week to 10 days of the month of February. Look at the mild weather pattern. Not bad with outdoor work, but again, uh, increased evaporation over the central and southern plains, Gulf Coast areas and through Texas over the southwestern sections of the country. Uh, the cold air kind of retreating some, but that compaction of temperatures, we begin to pick up a little more active weather pattern. Good news here, Pacific Northwest, normal precip, but a long way to go to the central and southern areas of California, drying out into the southern plains, normal precip over the southeast, and a propensity for more organized snows, we think, for the northern and eastern sections of the Corn Belt, the northeast of New England. Just because you haven't had snow thus this way, this far into the wintertime season, doesn't mean it's going to go that way for the rest of the winter season. How do you see the week of Valentine's Day? Yeah, it looks like for some good snuggling weather here for the upper Midwest, Great Lakes region, into the Corn Belt locales, northern and eastern areas, warm for the central and southern valleys of California, down through Oklahoma and Texas, normal temperatures over the southeastern part of the country. A little more action on the maps and charts with temperatures and precip combining for, again, a stormy scenario. Montana, the Pacific Northwest, late season winter storms, Great Lakes region, northern and eastern Corn Belt locales, and significant moisture here for dryness and drought over the southeastern part of the country. Little to none, valleys of California and the southwest. Next on This Week in Agribusiness, it's Max's Tractor Shed, spotlighting another great American tractor. Well, it's a Farm All M at the tractor shed this weekend, probably one of the last ones made. It's a 1951 M, but there's a little more to the story behind it, as we'll share. And Max's Tractor Shed, brought to you by Storelock Tool Cabinets. They have red ones if you want them. Oh, yes, and they have uh, green and yellow ones. A variety of colors with great utility in those Storelock Tool Cabinets. Go to their website, storelock.com. Well, I had the privilege of meeting Greg Bronstetter last summer at the Farm Progress Show. I didn't know Greg had this tractor, though. I'll tell you a little bit about it in a moment. Greg is battling ALS, and so they harvested the last crop on his farm in Michigan this fall, and he decided to have an auction just last month. He can devote full attention now to his battle with ALS, but his neighbor and lifelong friend, Matt Schwab, said, I want that tractor. Matt made up his mind that at the auction he was going to be the successful bidder. Take a look at the tractor here. Matt told me that he wanted that so he could keep it as a reminder and an honor of his lifelong friend, Greg Bronstetter. But now, look at that hook on there. There's a cylinder and three hydraulic valves on that nearly 70-year-old M. The folks who owned it before Greg had an auto repair shop. They could use that M to hook a car and haul it in. Well, you may see it one of these years at the famous Mackinac Bridge tractor ride. As Matt Schwab told me, he plans to have it there. There'll be people asking about that hook, I'm sure. It'll give Matt Schwab a perfect opening to tell them all about it and about his lifelong buddy, Greg Bronstetter, at Standish, Michigan. A lot of great tractors and other machines crossing the block at Big Iron Auctions. Let's hear about that from Mark Stock. 
Hello, Max, and hello, everybody. Big Iron has got Big Iron Realty. We've got Big Iron Livestock and, of course, Big Iron Machinery. And this week, we've got a lot of different things selling. January the 25th, 80 acres of Platte County, Nebraska land will sell for Lucas and Anna Lucky, plus 239 acres of Platte County land will sell for Carly S. Eaton Revocable Trust. January the 25th, Big Iron Livestock Division will sell some quality cattle for Sand Dune Cattle Company, LLC, out of Sargent, Nebraska. They'll sell several quality registered Red Angus bulls, plus commercial commercial Red Angus bred heifers and open heifers. Then on January the 26th, Bradley Lundeen has 30 items selling by Hildreth, Nebraska, including a 2012 John Deere S670 combine. They've also got a John Deere 1293 cornhead. Larson Farms out of Frankfurt, Indiana. They've got a 2011 Apache AS1020 sprayer with only 416 hours selling. And on January 26th, the Robert Razak retirement auction by Yankton, South Dakota includes 2004 Case H2366 combine a 2015 Case IH 4406 Cornhead, plus a 2014 Case IH 335 VT Vertical Tillage Machine. And also, Michael Barboza from Turpin, Oklahoma, will sell a 2002 International 8100 truck with a Coon Knight feed box. A lot of good quality land, livestock, and equipment selling on BigIron.com. This Week in Agribusiness is proud to continue getting to know FFAers across the country. And this week, we're meeting Morgan Anderson. She's the Ohio State FFA Vice President. Morgan, what are you excited about in 2022? I think with the new year, excited is such an understatement. Um, right now in Ohio, we're coming on to a spring of celebration for sure. We just finished up leadership nights where our state officer team was able to hit and reach over 3,000 members through impactful engagement with chapters on that local level. And now we're celebrating our success with the new year, whether that be with chapter banquets where we get to visit and um, speak alongside them, or even our own 94th Ohio FFA State Convention. In. We are celebrating to say the least, and I'm so excited to have a year where we get to do that in person with members. That is a lot of fun. Morgan, what was it that got you involved with FFA in the beginning? Of course. So although I'm rooted um, family wise in rural central Ohio, my background isn't directly correlated with agriculture in terms of a one on one basis. I actually was able to pave my own way through FFA with my individual engagement and career development events, uh, one of which being the prepared public speaking CDE. And through that, I was able to enhance my critical thinking skills, um, my poise and my speech writing, as well as learn a little bit more about food supply and innovation in um, agricultural sustainability. And that is how I found my upbringing in the FFA, even without necessarily having that family um, basis that created my start. That's fantastic. Morgan Anderson, we wish you the best of luck to the Ohio State FFA Vice President. Stay with us. Just ahead, we'll talk about grain bin safety. January is that time of year that a lot of farmers have to get into their bins to check the condition of the crop. Max, as you well know, warm and cold spells, they certainly change the way that grain is stored, but can be unsafe. Every year a farmer gets in trouble in a grain bin, and it happens often, and it seems too often. Brad Liggett noticed that too. He's the president of Nationwide Agribusiness. They started a program to get those grain rescue tubes out there to rural fire departments. Brad visited with me about it. This is our ninth season. This will be our ninth campaign of Grain Bin Safety Week. Uh, we started it back min those years ago because we just kept seeing so many entrapments and the tragic loss of life that would happen. And we said, wow, we're just not sure this has got enough awareness. Let's have a campaign where we raise awareness, get everybody involved. Not only do we want to raise awareness, we also heard loud and clear from local fire departments that they needed equipment and they needed training on how to rescue folks out of a grain bin when they're trapped in there. And that has been the neatest part of our campaign as well, is getting out there and getting these, uh, we're now over 200 tubes across 30 states in America uh, to local fire departments, training and tube. Those are not cheap. There is, there's an investment there, otherwise many of those departments would already have those. So you guys have really stepped up to 
not only, I guess, provide the tube itself, but training as well, is that right? Absolutely. Yeah, uh, historically the tubes have been running about uh, $2,500. They're made out of aluminum, and bear with us. Uh, we keep telling the local fire departments uh, with the supply chain issues, we're having to wait a little bit for the tubes, but we're going to get them built. We're going to get them done. And then the training itself is another couple thousand bucks worth of time. We we work with the uh, good folks in uh, at NECAS, the uh, National Education of, for Ag Safety, and uh, NECAS we partner with. They uh, we get, we got them a trailer. Uh, our friends at Corteva helped us get a second trailer, and uh, they go all across the country giving these local fire departments the training they need. You know, every now and then I'll think, well, okay, this is behind us now. We don't have this happening anymore. And then you hear about it. Last fall, there was one in eastern North Carolina. There was one in, in eastern Iowa. They, they just keep happening. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, we're, I guess we're proud to say that the program and the tubes that have uh, been donated have helped save five lives now. Uh, obviously, the goal of the campaign is to make it where no one ever really needs to be rescued. If we can get awareness out there of how dangerous of a work environment it is when you go into a grain bin. Maybe we can get those farmers thinking, hmm, I'm not going to go in alone, or I'm going to get a harness on, and I'm going to be extra careful if I, if I ha don't go in at all, or if you do go in, really recognize how dangerous that work, workplace is. They're raising the awareness to be sure at Nationwide Agribusiness February 20th through the 26th, Grain Bin Safety Week. And rural fire departments can apply by April 30th. To get that, just Google Grain Bin Safety Week. We'll see you next week right here on This Week in Agribusiness. Thanks for being here. So long, everyone. Closed captioning for This Week in Agribusiness is brought to you by Kubota. Shape your world. This Week in Agribusiness is brought to you by Case IH. This Week in Agribusiness is produced by Omax Communication in association with 22 Creative Group. We invite you to visit us online at agbizweek.com.